Doug Tallman, a reporter at Montgomery Community Media, and this is Montgomery Talk, our regular podcast on local issues. Today I'm talking with Mark Elrich, who took office in December as Montgomery County's 7th County Executive. Welcome, Mr. Elrich. Good morning. For some personal data, you're 69 years old. True. You grew up in Montgomery County. Except for my first 10 years in D.C. Okay. You graduated at Einstein High School. Yep. You taught at Rolling Terrace Elementary in Tacoma Park. You were first elected to the county council in 2006. Yep. And before that, you spent 19 years on the Tacoma Park County Council. City Council. Excuse me. Tacoma Park City Council. You still live in Tacoma Park? Yeah. With your special needs son? Yep. Which leads to my first question. Uh, How has your political views, your policy views, been informed by living with your son? Um, I mean, I've lived with him so long, it's just framed my outlook on the world to some extent. You know, I, I got him, I think, might have been 25 years old. Uh, so it's a long-term relationship, and you uh, you see how people react to people with special needs. You realize, you know, I, I watched him go through different iterations of the school system, some not so good, some much better. You know, so I have a perspective on how education of special needs children has changed over time and how the services in the community have changed over time. And I certainly am really aware of, you know, the importance of the services that are provided both for the the people who have special needs, but also for the parents the people who have special needs. I was at three events last week. All of them dealt with uh, aging parents dealing with aging special needs children and the challenges those that brings up. So I think I have a sensitivity to it that certainly affects my outlook. Mm-hmm. Um, since you bring up the school system, I've got a, I have a question that's been lingering for about a week or so. The legislature ended by passing the Kerwin Commission legislation. It meant, um, let me look it up here, it says $24.4 million more for the county. Right. You submitted a budget that, from the school board's point of view, has a $14.5 million hole. But no one seems to have a clear indication of whether the uh, the Kerwin money is actually going to plug that hole. Do you have an answer on that now? Well, our belief was that some of it would, others of it would not. I mean, obviously, it's bigger than the hole. Uh, some of it was targeted toward special education, and uh, the school system told us that you know a portion of that would plug part of that hole. They also identified additional savings in their health care plan, which meant they wouldn't need as much as they thought we were going to need. So we thought we were much closer than the 14. And of course, you know, I gave the council $10 million. No county executive has ever done a budget and said, here's $10 million. Spend it where you think the most important uses are. And, you know, if I was a council member, I would look at some of the things that I didn't fully fund and say, let's put the money over there. But that's their decision. But we wanted to leave some latitude for the council to make some decisions with that money. But there's $10 million there that can certainly plug whatever remains of the hole and and address a little bit of what Montgomery College wanted as well. Okay. So since we're on the state level, how do you get, how well do you get along with Larry Hogan? I actually feel like I'm getting along fine And, and as well with his staff. I mean, I've been able to, you know, disagree, for example, on, you know, his widening project on the Beltway in 270 and have a really positive relationship with Pete Ron and State Highway. We've kind of agreed to uh, work together where we can work together and disagree where we disagree. I have had a number of meetings with his secretaries and with, you know, some of his aides. And I'll say that I feel like I've made some progress and, you know, we've seen some positive things come down from the state for the county that I think are going to pay off and uh, and benefit the county. So I, I feel I feel pretty good about it. And, you know, they're, I know that when I want to, you know, talk to them about economic development projects, I'm not going to hit a deaf ear because they're as interested in this stuff as I am to the extent that I can grow stuff in Montgomery County the state benefits from that. So I think we're going to find lots of ways we work together. Okay. Um, bookmark almost everything you just said because we'll be cu- doubling back on, on several of the topics you brought up. But I think the first one I want to ask you about is essentially roads. The state revealed its options yeah. last week, and it didn't seem as though their study supported uh, reversible lanes on 270, much the way the council and, and you as a council member, when you were a council member, supported. Although it is one of the seven or so odd options that are right. on the table. What, what has to happen next? 
hopefully we have to work with them, particularly work with the state highway people, because there's no reason not to do two reversible lanes. We have very directional traffic here. You know, you, the cars pile up going south in the morning, and you have a pretty good stream flowing north in the morning. The problem is not northbound in the morning, much like the problem is not southbound in the evening. It's northbound in the evening. And to build two lanes in each direction that you're only going to use half the day, or actually only during one, one or the other rush hour, is a real waste of money. And we've got the real estate to do the reversibles, and to me, it would be a shame not to do the reversibles. It would mean spending, you know, tens and tens of millions of more dollars if they try to do what they're talking about. The bridges, both over the Beltway and over I-270, don't fit. You cannot fit the lanes they're talking about underneath the current bridge structure. So it's not like you're working with a blank slate where you could paint in anything you want and everything's green. They have some really serious constraints. And I know that the state's actually working on other options. Hogan, long before he launched this, he asked for solicitations for ideas that could help 270 for far less than a billion dollars. I think his target maybe was $100 million. The state actually found some things. So if you drive down 270, you'll see a bunch of work going on in the roadway. And uh, the state's also looking at using the two inside service lanes, the ones that are next to the barriers, make them the HOV lanes, and then turn the current HOV lane into a third lane. I told the governor, wrote to him in the fall, and said, if you want to win right now, just grab the lane you can get. You know, for a little bit of paint, you turn the current service lane into a through lane for HOV vehicles. You capture that lane as a through lane for everybody else. Adding a lane to 270, I think, would be a welcome addition. So there are solutions they could have done for very, very little money. There's some other stuff they can do. Repainting the lanes, extending slightly the, the outside service areas so they can shift things over enough to get another lane inside the current configuration. So there are multiple ways to fix this without spending the amount of money they're talking about on 270. Okay. The report also said they just didn't think transit was a good idea for either the Beltway or um, 270, and you've been a huge proponent yeah. of, of transit. So it's, it's ironic because a year earlier when we were dealing with Amazon, and Amazon insisted that the state come up with a traffic solution, their solution to I-270 was to do whatever Hogan was going to do with his $100 million, plus add a third track on the mark rail to get into West Virginia, which would allow bi-directional all-day-long service. So you could actually run it, you know, as close to, say, a subway as you wanted, but certainly um, real commuter rail with trains going back and forth. That would have an enormous impact on the ability to move people who are currently using 270. And, and that was a solution for Amazon, along with a bunch of bus rapid transit lines to service a Rockville Pike to handle all the traffic that was going to be coming. None of this is part of the solution. So how do you go from a year earlier realizing that transit would make a major impact on 270 to a year later saying we don't believe transit has an impact? So I just think they're wrong and unfortunately expensively wrong. And I think there are other options for them you know, to continue to look at. On the Beltway, it was instructive because I listened to the Secretary's testimony, and his basis for saying there's no alternative on the Beltway was that when they did the Purple Line study, the Purple Line indicated that didn't relieve the Beltway and you would need to do, you would need additional fixes. Well, that's true, but that study, A, was done quite a while ago. I would agree that the Purple Line's not going to fix the Beltway, but if you're doing if you're supposed, to, you're supposed to compare alternatives and look at alternatives, looking at something that's already being built for a purpose other than fixing the beltway and saying that doesn't fix the beltway doesn't pass the test of looking at transit alternatives. They didn't explore a single transit alternative, any other way of moving people on the beltway. And without a study that shows that none of the transit alternatives would provide additional capacity, I think they seriously failed the test there. A beltway is much more constrained. And, you know, I honestly don't see, you know, at least in much of Montgomery County, how you, you're going to manage widening between Wisconsin Avenue and New Hampshire Avenue, between several very large bridges. The fact that you have to get under at, at uh, near Forest Glen Road, you've got a railroad track, not just a road bridge, but you've got a railroad bridge. When you get up to Wisconsin Avenue, you have a metro bridge. Now, how you simultaneously widen the road and don't take Metro out of service for a year 
is beyond me. And the same thing with Wisconsin Avenue. That Those bridge abutments are right up to the current lane widths, and there's nothing but concrete going on either side of those abutments. So there's no way they're squeezing lanes through there. Now, they've, they've talked about some incredibly expensive alternatives. One is cantilevering a road over the Beltway. I'll just say good luck with that. And the other is uh, cut and cover, where they would cut out sections of the Beltway, two lanes, for as long as you can cut them out of the time, and then insert, like, tunnel sections. Only these would probably be rectangular, so the lower level becomes a roadbed and the upper level becomes a roadbed even with the current Beltway. Can you do it physically? Possibly. It doesn't doesn't give you an answer to what happens when you get to, say, where the Beltway goes over Georgia Avenue, and anything below the current roadway would be at the Georgia Avenue level. I don't know how that works. And it is incredibly expensive, and in order to dig out two lanes on the Beltway, you're going to have to disrupt at least three lanes, the two you cut out and the lane next to it, if not two lanes next to it. And that's not a project that's going to get done in six months. You're talking about a very, very long project to do that much cutting, filling, and putting the boxes in place. So I don't know if anybody would ever fund this project because of what it's going to cost. In the past, you've been such a proponent of transit, particularly with bus rapid transit and whatnot. It sparked uh, a question just feet from here with the county executive um, debate when Nancy Florine asked you, why do you hate roads? Why do you hate roads? <laughs> I don't hate roads. That's, uh, that's wrong. But I supported the Watkins Mill interchange. I'm proposing solutions on 355 that have add capacity that 355 needs, but you know, roads are a very mid 20th century solution to a problem that we all know. It doesn't get solved by building more roads. Any, any investment in roads means the inability to invest in transit, and that just means that the next step is always more roads. We've answered every single problem with roads, and roads have not solved any single problem. Every time we do it, they just fill up again. And uh, just for environmental reasons alone, we need to figure a better way of dealing with uh, how we're going to move people. So I'd say, you know, f- environmentally, this is really backward and it's not the direction we need to be going. Roads, just you just can't say roads are a solution to anything automatically. And the real problem is, and it's true with Hogan's proposal, and I talked to his people about it, you could speed people around the Beltway faster, I mean, if you could. But when you get to Georgia Avenue in the morning and you want to get off on Georgia Avenue, that exit used to be a one-lane exit getting onto Georgia Avenue. And that backed up to the Surrender Dorothy Bridge. I think everybody knows what that is. Mm-hmm. It's iconic. So they added a second exit lane on Georgia Avenue. It still backs up to the Surrender Dorothy Bridge. The problem is Georgia Avenue. Our biggest problem, you know, the beltways in 270, they get congested. But when you get off, you don't go into free-flowing traffic. You don't get off the major highway and take a quick trip to where you're trying to get to work at. None of our highways actually go through our work centers. Not a single highway goes through a work center, so you've got to get off the highway and drive into, you know, downtown Silver Spring, Bethesda, Friendship Heights, wherever you're going. It takes a, a trip on a road that's already congested. And I told the governor that if you want to help the Beltway, help us with transit on roads like Georgia, Connecticut, and Wisconsin so I can move cars there more quickly so they're not backed up so that the people trying to get off the Beltway don't hit a dead stop because they can't get onto these roads. So you need a comprehensive solution. And before I go to roads, I would look at, you know, what we're going to do to move people on the interior of Montgomery County. And you're not widening Georgia Avenue and you're not widening Connecticut and Wisconsin Avenue. So if those things are off the table, you better be looking at transit solutions. So I'm a believer that you got to do transit. There's some road projects I support. You know, like I said, you'll see a road project on 355 north of Montgomery Village that goes to Clarksburg that adds additional capacity, and part of it's going to be a road. You're going to see an alternative solution to Montrose Parkway, which is also going to involve pavement for lanes and a road. I just believe that you need, you should build what you need, and you shouldn't just automatically just build. And I know engineers love symmetry. But symmetry isn't always necessary. Okay. I think now's a good time to take a quick break. This is Doug Tolman at Montgomery Community Media speaking with County Executive Mark Elrich. We'll be right back. (music) 
MCM, your community media center, is making Montgomery County a great place to live through programs like 21 This Week. Montgomery County's hardest hitting political talk show keeps you up to date with the local political scene. Montgomery Community Media, our middle name is Community. Okay, welcome back. This is Doug Tallman over at Montgomery Community Media speaking with County Executive Mark Elrich. I said before I wanted you to bookmark what you had just said. We talked about transportation. Now I'd like to talk about economic development. David Petter is leaving the uh, Economic Development Commission. It's actually separate from the county, but yep. will you have any sort of influence in who his replacement is? I don't pick his replacement. Well, I Hopefully I have some influence on the replacement. I mean, I... I th but I also think, you know, one of the problems was that before the ECDC, the county was the be-all and end-all of economic development and, and pretty much the end-all, not the be-all. And we weren't doing a very good job in, of recruiting. And I would ask questions like, why aren't we at trade shows? Why aren't we in California? And it was always like, oh, we don't need to. We don't need to. So I didn't think we did what we should have done. But handing it off to the ECDC, Economic Development Corporation, I get the initials wrong, the problem was we stripped all the economic power out of the county and, you know, turned left it with the skeletal operation and put the money and resources in the Economic Development Corporation, which we set up primarily to fish for big fish and to help with expansions of, you know, companies. But they were never meant to be a kind of local economic development entity. And so we lost the ability to work at the local level, stripped ourselves of the ability and created an, an entity which justifiably ought to focus on a couple of target missions and not try to be everything to everybody. So one of the things that we're doing, apart from the Economic Development Corporation, is we're strengthening our own economic department work. So like our Department of Housing and Community Affairs was you know, primarily housing. It used to have a decent economic development component, and that got weakened. So we are reinvesting in that department. We're going to have a deputy director for housing, but we're looking for a director who has a focus on economic development. We're going to put our incubator efforts in there. We've opened up one small business center in the Germantown Regional Services Center. We're going to be putting economic development specialists back to work in the regional service centers so they can work with small businesses and small you know, building owners and shopping center owners. We're trying to revitalize economic development in the spheres that are not the spheres that the Economic Development Corporation is doing. So we're trying to go back to having a full effort on how you do economic development. And we've talked with the state about ways that if, you know, if we do some things, would you be willing to you know, assist? Where can we go to the state for help? And they've got robust, robust programs in the Small Business Administration we hope to take more advantage of. Um, I've talked with uh, the Secretary of Commerce about a couple of ideas that, that we're exploring that I would really like to have state support on. I'm very concerned about the IT drain. I think you know a lot of businesses are concerned about Amazon and what will be a very rapid stripping of IT talent from existing companies in the DC area. And you know Virginia companies are worried about it. I've talked to Maryland companies that are big companies that are worried about losing you know some of the best IT people to Amazon. And we need to find a way to produce more skilled IT talent in the county. And Montgomery College does a good job at, you know, you might say basic prep, but it's not necessarily what the industries need, the high, higher level certificates. And we need to figure out a way, as some other jurisdictions have done, to produce a stream of people with higher level certi certifications that will be support that can be supportive of existing businesses, but also provide talent that someone would say Montgomery County has a stream of talented people. I want to go there because they're providing high talented IT people. So we're looking for opportunities. And, and I've always told people I am not desirous of being the author of every idea. So we are looking at what other people are doing. And if we see good ideas, we're studying them and, and we'll steal them. Well, speaking of stealing, Amazon is uh, pulling out of New York. David Petter said he called up Amazon as soon as he heard that. You shake your head. Yeah, we got a nice letter back saying that whatever expansion they're going to do, they're going to focus on the existing cities where they have a presence. So they're not looking for another. They're not looking for another New York. They're thinking more about how they would spread things among places they already 
have it. So I don't know. You never know what's true. They could say that and then be actually looking for a second place. But, you know, they certainly know that uh, the governor has expressed an interest of, hey, we're here. <laughs> we're still willing to help. And I don't know of anything that's come back to the governor's office either. Okay. You had, you had said, and I believe Mr. Petter had confirmed this, that you were going to go to California to talk to the companies that would be moving east with the Virginia site. I believe that trip was planned for April, and it's April, and, and do you have your PAGs back? I, I am not setting up. They are setting it up. So they're supposed to set the itinerary of companies I'm going to go to, and I said, when you have that, I will go. So we originally, I originally thought they were going to do it at the end of January, and that didn't happen. And obviously we're in April, and I don't have an itinerary. But the plan is just for me to go there as soon as they put the, or together a list of appointments and when I'm going to be there. I, I think it's worth taking the trip out there. I think Montgomery County has a lot to offer, and is, there are lots of good reasons to come here. And frankly, in some ways, we have... We have opportunities I think we can offer people that some of the other areas don't have. And I want to be able to talk to them about that. Like what? I thought, you know, White Flint's strength was location on transit. So now we, you know, the loss of Amazon still now leaves a void in White Flint. We could create anything we wanted there. You know, we have the ability to take a place that sits on a metro that's well positioned between NIH and, you know, the Science City to the north and position this in a way that can meet any number of, you know, different interests. I mean, bio could easily be a focus of a redevelopment effort in that area because you would be sandwiched between two major hubs of bioactivity. And we could market a research corridor that stretched from, you know, Science City and the immunogens of the North to NIH. And I think there are some creative ways to do that. And I've been approached by a couple of people who I think have creative ideas and we're exploring them. Okay. You mentioned before incubators, and I've seen you quoted that you want to become a hub of incubators. And what I found curious was you mentioned it in terms of a question about this, I'm talking about the WAMU article. You made it, you talked about incubators in relation to the vacancy rate in um, commercial real estate. How often has a company started in a Montgomery County incubator and actually m made some kind of dent in the vacancy rate of commercial real estate around here? So we have not been attractive to incubators. And the incubators that you know started here originally were ours. And we did not do a very good job um, I think our incubators had a strong point at, at one point, and then they got kind of neglected. And now HO City is sit, HOC is sitting in half an incubator in Silver Spring, which is pretty ridiculous because it's obviously not an incubator. So I think you know there there are opportunities to market certain parts of the county. I'm thinking a lot about Twinbrook, where there's light industrial space, smaller buildings, not zoned for high rises, so people aren't going to get priced out by rents as quickly as they will in other areas that might well be a target. I was at a private incubator um, a couple of months ago, and there are a couple of other private incubators sprouting up. So it may be that things are, are beginning to happen here, but part of it's, I think, going to depend on how we look at some of the opportunities to do other development in the county. I keep hearing the word collision spaces from people. So people would say the weakness in uh, Science City is it's still very much like office parks. And so there are no collision spaces. People don't walk out of one building and encounter a bunch of other people on, a sign to, uh, on the sidewalk and decide to stroll over to a really good coffee shop next to a hip bakery uh, or any of this other stuff. So was, we have a concentration of science, but we don't have a lot of connectivity and collision between these people. And so I think part of our task is to look at an area like that and say, what could we do that would create spaces where people would come and co-mingle to try to recreate what people encounter in the higher level biospaces and, uh, are often cited as you know the Bostons of the world where people get out and they meet people and they encounter people and you just don't do that here. So you're trying to look at what, uh, what are other models and how can you replicate what other people have managed to put together. And I think we're gonna, we are going to be able to do more in the incubator space, and we're gonna look at more robust models of incubators. You know, we focused very heavily on the bio world, and there's a ton of incubators that actually focus on light industrial, uh, 
maker spaces, uh, skilled craftspeople who make things and open up shops and, and do business. And so we're looking at incubators both at the high end but also at the lower end. And I think there are opportunities to create spaces where people can launch businesses that would get them into a small space in a shopping center where they can sell and make things. Okay. On another topic, there are residents around Olney are upset about the construction of a radio tower for public safety. I think they're looking to you to halt this tower. What do you tell them? I told them that we are looking very hard and very fast. I was called into a tower meeting by the county and I was told, well, here we are and we got these two sites and uh, they didn't do any of the work they should have done. They didn't work with residents. If you know they had worked with residents and seen what kind of reaction they were going to get, they would have had plenty of time to explore alternatives. And they boxed themselves into a situation where we've got a deteriorating infrastructure and by not involving people and not taking the time to look at what alternatives there were, we have been really constrained. However, I've been working with uh, State Senator Kramer and with State Highway, and we are actually exploring alternatives, and we're trying to do it as quickly as possible so that everything that needs to happen can happen when it's supposed to happen. I am I'm not pessimistic. Uh, I am guardedly optimistic that we're going to be able to come up with some solutions, but I really think this is an example of you cannot keep things from the public and then pop it on them at the last minute and then say, oh, gee, I have no choice now. I have no other alternatives because I don't have time. I'm, I am not going to operate that way. I apologize to people for what I inherited, but I will not do stuff like that. Another community that's looking for some county help is Poolsville. They want a new high school. They want a, some sort of center for com- county services. What's the likelihood of them getting what they want? I can't control the new high school thing. The schools have to put that in to a plan. And I think they make a good case. I think the school was built in 53 or something like that. They've had a new science wing, but otherwise that building is really, really old. Um, and they've... They've made a lot out of an old building, but it is, in fact, a very old building. So we're, you know, I can't alter the construction schedule, but, you know, what happened, we we went, I did these listening sessions, and I was up in Poolsville, and we got a very clear message. They've got this orga- organized campaign about being fair to Poolsville, and they talked about the dearth of services in Poolsville, that any government service they need, they've got to trek out of Poolsville. And this is true of the whole ag area, but Poolsville, because it's actually a city, they have to trek out down to Germantown or Gaithersburg. So we are working with them. We're looking at the school system. When they built the new science building, that's whatever renovation they do to the school, that science building is going to stay intact. That wing will stay intact. So we're looking at what we can add to that wing in the way of a multi-service center, um, the school system has said they would allow, consider the very positive letter they wrote to the community about being able to build onto the center. Now, they're not going to build onto it. They would give us permission to build onto it, but we're looking at it. So right now we're scoping out a program of requirements. We've talked about what kind of services we might be able to bring up there on a mobile basis until we're actually able to build something and get it operating. But they're right. You know, they're stranded up there. And they're in the ag reserves, so they're never going to have a high-density population. But that shouldn't mean you can't get basic services. You mentioned your listening tour made that stop in Poolsville. You've done a lot of listening since you took office. Two questions. First one is, will there be a doing tour? (laughs) Well, doing is putting this into, you know, like in Poolsville's case, trying to deal with it and provide services. You know, and a lot of doing isn't specific. I'd say across the county, a lot of the concerns were countywide concerns. There are every neighborhood, every community had a road or some project that was more localized. But a lot of the issue was school overcrowding, traffic, you know, all these other kind of things that are generic across the county. So I couldn't have a, a touring, a, a doing tour in the same way as I'd have. But I am going to do the listening tours again. Because I think they're really valuable, and I want people to feel that they can come out and, and talk to me. And, you know, I took unscripted questions. There was no moderator looking through written questions and deciding which one I was getting. People stood up, took the mic, and I answered as best I could. What did you learn from your uh, listening tour? 
Uh, I learned, again, I learned things like the Poolsville issue. Uh, people were very clear about the Olney issue and the, the tower over there. There's a lot of concern about homelessness, and I do think we need to do a better job. I think the counties, you know, for whatever reasons, people were content in the warm weather months to, to just accept that people would sleep outside. I don't think that's a very good solution to the problem, so we're looking at what we can do to provide more housing for people in homelessness. I'm doing what I can on school construction. I'm hoping I spent a lot of time in Annapolis asking for capital and operating money for the school system because the county is never going to be able to meet these needs. Uh, the state has always given us less than what we probably should get. I wanted to try to work what I could to get you know greater funds out of the state and to talk about this as being a partnership with the state, not just something that is solely Montgomery County's responsibility. I guess, you know, you know, there was, any, there was issues raised about policing, issues raised about immigration. I, I heard it all. And, you know, we, the county's got, I think, you know, a positive policy on how we work with the immigrant community. And I reassured people. A lot of people wanted to know that I wasn't going to change things. And I reassured people that, you know, one of the best things about Ike was making this the more welcoming community. And, you know, if anything, my job is to make it more welcoming and figure out what else we can do to help people not pull back on it. So I think a lot of people were relieved that a change in administration wasn't going to result in a change in that. I think a lot of nonprofits were relieved that I wasn't going to, you know, gut the nom you know, the grant system. And there was, I've heard, I heard people say, well, rumor is you're going to do this and you're going to do that. And it's like, no, I'm not. And so I had a chance to answer people's questions directly and let them know, I'm not getting, this, getting rid of this advisory group. I'm not going to defund mm -hmm. this organization. So I think a lot of what I was able to do is reassure people that change didn't mean I was going to throw everything out and start over. You made a comment in January about uh, not wanting to build housing for millennials. And during the campaign, you referred to the Purple Line as ethnic cleansing. But see, uh, those are both wrong. That's because you read blogs. Who, who, have, who aren't reporters. Uh, so well, what I said was, I didn't say the Purple Line was ethnic cleansing. I said the particular plan of park and planning to rezone Long Branch, where they would have gotten rid of all of the low-income apartments, was ethnic cleansing. I don't know what else you call it. I could, do, I could use the word they used in D.C., urban removal, where they target whole populations of people who cannot afford to live generally in the county and are living here. And then you say... How much zoning density do I give you to tear these buildings down? That's a crime. And after I made my comments, what was the reaction of the planning board and the council? They changed their policy and removed their recommendations. So I would say I was right. They didn't think about what they were doing. So I, I'm, you know, I could have used a nicer word, but it's frustrating when people who are doing long-term planning for the county look at a community and say, how can I rezone this so these people won't be able to live here anymore? And how, and how you can not know that as a planner, that this population, because of their incomes, their immigrant status, their family size, wouldn't qualify for market rate MPDUs or MPDUs if, I, if what I built was MPDUs. So I'm unapologetic. I, I won on that one. Now, the millennial thing, I didn't say I wasn't going to build housing for millennials. I wasn't going to tear down a neighborhood to build housing for millennials. You can take any several words and put them together and say this is the gist of what you said. But, you know, this whole talk about we're going to build this great place and this could be next to the Purple Line and all these young millennials will come here. It's like I am not going to tear down an existing community that houses a lower income population for a different group of people who, by the way, in, in their age group are now growing out of the single apartments anyway. And when they form families, they're doing what all of us did, which is they're looking for larger houses, not one bedroom apartments. And 80 percent of what this county has allowed to be built, and this is true in spades in Bethesda, is one bedroom apartments. And all this nonsense people talked about, well, we're going to make Bethesda a place where millennials could live and bring all these multiple generations there. 80% of the housing, one-bedroom apartments, the highest prices in the country. Bethesda now ranks as one of the highest rent places in the United States. Nothing we said did we do. And there were a couple of millennial commercial brokers who actually helped in my campaign. They were in a meeting, I guess it's last summer, in Bethesda with the building industry. And one of them asked the developers, you know, what are we going to do about millennial housing? And they said, we're not going to build millennial housing in Bethesda. One of the, the county regional service person 
Ken Hartman, not me. And Ken doesn't, you know, not my politics. He's not been an advocate in any of this. He was at that meeting. He said that's exactly what they said. So we, the council and park and planning, talk about what we're doing to provide all these opportunities for these young millennials. They, the building industry, say point blank, we're not building it for them. I'm sorry. You know, we, we say one thing and we do another. And we have not been very good at providing affordable housing. We talk about integrating the west side of the county with families so you can integrate the schools. How do I integrate the west side of the county if I allow people to only build one-bedroom apartments? And the council refuses the allowing or requiring a mix of units so that you could actually get families on the west side of the county. So you're doing all this building in Bethesda, and you make no requirement for family housing on the west side of the county? I mean, what kind of vision is this for the future? I'm just saying. <laughs> just say. Don't get me started. Don't get you started. <laughs> We're running kind of late, and I want to ask one last question. At your swearing in, the rabbi who gave the invocation mispronounced your name Ehrlich instead yeah. of Elrich. It's actually been rather a hobby of mine to count the number of times your name is misspelled <laughs> in public. And I'm just curious, how, how do you feel about that? I have one of those names that, for whatever reason, people... <laughs> Don't pronounce right, even though it's so phonetic that it's kind of hard to miss. L, rich, two syllables, you know, n nice natural break between the L and the R. You recognize what those sounds should be. People mess it up. But I tell you, when I when I ran in 2006, I laughed because it always got me two in introductions. Because somebody would say my name wrong, and then I'd get corrected, and then they'd say, correct it, and then they'd say my name again, so I get introduced twice. So I wasn't arguing about that. And my, my favorite thing is I didn't have bumper stickers. And people would tell me they saw my bumper stickers all the time. They were Governor Ehrlich's bumper stickers. <laughs> you know, sometimes a mistake is a good thing. Um, but I just, you know, you got to have a humor about it. I mean, some people get, you know, all indignant. You should know who. And it's like, yeah, people should know. But if they don't, it's not the end of the world. Right. People know who you are. As I recall from the swearing in, you had a big smile on your face when he did say uh, Elric instead of Elric. I knew it was coming. Somebody's going to do that to right. me. Okay. Well, this has been Montgomery Talk. We've had a nice uh, conversation here with County Executive Mark Elrich. Um, I'm sure we'll have you back at some point. Yeah. Good. I can find this place. Okay. <laughs> this is Montgomery Talks, our regular podcast on local issues. Our engineer today was Mike Valentine. Our executive producer is Gaynell Evans. Please join us next time. Thank you very much. Thank you.